Right, chapter 12. Human gin contact. Is it possible? Now, this is a long one. And then I think we've only got one more after this. Okay. Conjuration is tricky business. Regardless of a spirit's type and nature, good, bad or indifferent. All are difficult to summon and even more difficult to control. If a ritual is not executed properly or the summoner lacks the proper power, a spirit may wreak havoc, including damaging or draining the summoner's physical and mental health. The jinn are no different than other spirits and entities when it comes to being summoned. As they have free will, calling upon a jinni can be very dangerous. Just how it will react to the conjurer is anyone's guess. Like humans, jinn have their own rules that govern their behaviour. Just had a thought. Can, like, entities summon us? Mark's in the kitchen eating something. I said, we summon entities and jinn. Can they summon us? Well, oh, how would we would even... Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> in most cases, a jinni will ignore anyone trying to call upon it unless it has something to gain in return. Jinn also have been conjured to manipulate, possess and do harm to others. This can be a dangerous prospect because like us, not all jinn are good. Some are evil and a small number are downright psychotic. The Prophet Muhammad was able to call upon the jinn and when he did, they challenged his claim that he was a chosen prophet of Allah. In every version of the story, Muhammad is able to control the jinn and, conv and convince them he is indeed the prophet, resulted in, resulting in the jinn converting to Islam. Of the many stories told, the most popular and our favourite appears below. The Prophet Muhammad's contact with jinn. It is stated by Imam Bahaki in, oh goodness, da la 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 nubawat. That's going to need spelling out, I think. D A L A apostrophe I L hyphen A L hyphen N U B U W A A T. That the Prophet Muhammad once said to his companions in Mecca, Whosoever from amongst you desires to see the jinn, he should come to me tonight. <coughs> One of his followers, followers, Hadrat Abdullah ibn Masood, was the only one who came that night, for all others were fearful of the jinn. The Prophet took him to a high hill in Mecca on a clear moonless night. Muhammad drew a circle and told ibn Masood that no matter what happened, he was to remain seated and motionless within its confines. Hadrat Abdullah ibn Masood sat within the circle and began reciting the Quran. Suddenly, a large number of jinn appeared out of the smoke and encircled Muhammad, who was outside the circle. The jinn seemed to be creating a barrier around the Prophet, captivating him. Ibn Masood heard the jinn say to Muhammad, Who gives evidence that you are the Prophet? Muhammad pointed to a nearby tree and said, Will you accept my claim if the tree gives the evidence? The leader of the jinn said, Yes, we shall accept it. On that, the Prophet called the tree and it moved toward the jinn. This gave evidence to the group of jinn that Muhammad was indeed the prophet chosen by Allah. The jinn were so impressed that they gave praise to Allah and his prophet and conversed, converted to Islam. How did Muhammad know to place his companions within a circle for protection? Perhaps he was familiar with the concept of magic circles. Circles have had a magical protective significance since ancient times when they were drawn around the beds of sick persons and mothers who had just given birth but to protect them against demons. If a person summons spirits, a magic circle protects him against any negative influences and creates a symbolic barrier against his own lower nature. The story about Muhammad provides no clues as to whether or not he used any magical symbols or rituals in casting the circle, such as found in the magical law attributed to King Solomon. <clears throat> Solomon's control over the jinn. Ever since the days when King Solomon forced the jinn into slave labour, individuals have sought to harness their supernatural powers, usually for acquiring secret, secret knowledge, power, the ability to tell the future, procurement of love and riches and treasure. Solomon used a power granted him by God. 
a dominium which was to be given to no one after him. His power was channelled through a magical ring that nullified the jinn's ability to resist him. That legendary ring has vanished into the mist of time, but in its place are numerous manuals of magic, some are said to be written by Solomon himself. In the Western magical tradition, these handbooks come to be known as grimoires, and supposedly they were available only to the initiated. As with anything supposed to be forbidden or secret, however, they found their way into the masses. Many claimed roots of antiquity and lineages going back directly to Solomon, but most of the principal ones were written in Europe, especially France, in the 17th and 18th centuries during a period of renewed interest in magic. <clears throat> they are heavily derivative of Hebrew magical law, as well as Egyptian, Hellenistic and Greek magical texts. The most famous and oldest text attributed to Solomon is the Key of Solomon, also called the Greater Key of Solomon. The manual contains incantations and instructions for summoning jinn, called demons in Western translations. According to law, Solomon wrote all of his magical secrets in this book and ordered that upon his death it to be sealed in an ivory casket and placed in his tomb. Some time later, his tomb was opened and the casket and book were discovered. The Jewish historian Flavius Josephus re referenced such a book in the 1st century CE, but it's not clear whether he was referring to this grimoire or to the Testament of Solomon, which tells the stories of Solomon's jinn subjugation. God enabled Solomon to learn the skill which expels demons, which is a science useful and sanitative to men. He composed incantations also by which distempers are alleviated and he left behind him the manner of using exorcisms by which demons are driven away so that they never return. The key probably was written by one or more anonymous authors. It circulated as a magical text in Europe from about 1100 on, the earliest date of a known manuscript. Another Solomon Solomon, Solomonum, do, 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 do. Solomonic, do, 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 do. that's enough for that, magical text is the Lesser Key of Solomon, also called the Lemegeton, L-E-M-E-G-E-T-O-M, -E -E a term of unknown meaning, although it too claimed a direct line lineage from Solomon. It probably was written in stages by different anonymous authors from the 16th century on. It is derivative of the Testament of Solomon and the Book of Enoch, as well as the key. The, the Lemege, Lemege, oh, Lemegeton has four parts. The Ars Goetia describes the 72 fallen angels Solomon evoked and how they can be conjured. Whether or not the entities are actually fallen angels, jinn or something else remains uncertain. In Islamic belief, the books of magic attributed to Solomon are lies the jinn invented in an attempt to make Solomon come off as a sorcerer, a disbeliever. After his death, the jinn wrote books of magic and disbelief and placed them beneath Solomon's throne, claiming they were the texts he had used to subjugate them. The jinn then spread the lies throughout humanity, fooling people into thinking they could learn genuine magic secrets. Summoning the jinn. Another Western text of interest in relation to summoning jinn is the Black Pullet, probably written in France or elsewhere in Europe in the late 18th century. It is one of the few, few grimoires that does not claim to be ancient, but it does feature the jinn, though they are not called by that name. It evokes a Solomonic legend centering on the use of talismanic rings and inscribed circles as the channels of magical power. According to the legend told in the Black Pullet, the magical secrets were discovered by an anonymous soldier in Napoleon's army sent to Egypt. Near the pyramids in Cairo, he and several companions were attacked by Arab soldiers. All but him were killed, and he was left for dead. By sunset, he feared he too would soon expire, but suddenly a stone rolled back in the Great Pyramid, and a turban Turk came out. The Turk took the soldier inside, where there were vast halls, huge galleries, subterranean chambers and piles of treasures, all ministered by spirits. We may assume them to be jinn. The attendant of the Turk was a jinn, also called a spirit in the text, named Odus. After the soldier recovered his health, the Turk 
took him into his confidence. All the riches in the pyramid were the product of 80 years of occult and magical practice, which the Turk wished to pass on to the soldier, as he was nearing death himself. To demonstrate his power, the Turk showed him a magical ring. He blew on it three times and said an incantation. Attendant spirits, gin, and whatever else the Turk wished appeared. He manifested a sumptuous feast of fine food and wine in this manner. The Turk showed the soldier the black pullet, described as like a version of the Arabian folktale Aladdin and the Enchanted Lamp, but with an extra inner spiritual meaning. The text told how to acquire magical power with 22 talismans embroidered on silk and etched on rings made of bronze steel. The Turk said he was the only one who possessed this knowledge. He guided the soldier through all 22 talismans. At the end, he summoned Odus to bind him over to the soldier. Odus, the soldier, reported, appeared as a young man of the most beautiful stature. The remainder of his person shone with all the charms, and on the summit of his head shone a flame of which my eyes could not sustain the brilliance. From this description, it is easy to see how this entity might be interpreted as an angel or guardian spirit. The Turk had another gift for the soldier, in addition to the magical manual, a black hen. Pullet, coming from the French term for chicken, poulet, trained to find gold. In fact, a ritual to create a gold-finding hen was one of the most important parts of the black pullet. After being taught the secrets, the, sol the soldier lost consciousness. The Turk died and was cremated, and Odus became the soldier's dedicated servant. They departed for Europe, taking the book, the Turk's ashes, the black hen and the piles of treasure. In France, the soldier published the book. He used the black hen to find great hidden riches. The, the connection of these Western magical ritual guys to the jinn are quite clear. The claims to Solomonic heritage, the jinni like servants, the evoking of the Arabian law of wish-granting jinni, and the lure of great treasure, one of the specialities of the jinn. The entities in the Western grimoires may be called spirits, demons, fallen angels or angels, but the jinn lurk behind them. Material from the various grimoires has found its way into many books and texts on magic, mixing in some cases with Christianised material. Magical rituals continue to be reinterpreted in modern times, with additions from modern paganism and even shamanic traditions. The result is that origins become increasingly obscure, something the jinn would appreciate and encourage in order to mask their presence. Some Western rituals have been specifically adapted from Middle Eastern sources to conjure jinn, not demons or spirits. Many in the Islamic world disapprove of Westerners meddling with jinn, believing that non-believers, infidels, do not have the right or the proper knowledge for doing so. Middle Eastern texts and rituals for summoning the jinn, summoning the jinn have existed for centuries and are still available for use in modern times. Muslims may not think that others have the right to engage the jinn, but the jinn predate Islam, and they are, in some form or another, everywhere. Some jinn conjuring rituals are taught orally, and others are written in magical handbooks. Like Western grimoires, jinn magical manuals are for sale everywhere, in marketplaces and on the internet. One can even buy rings, pendants and bottles allegedly holding jinn who are waiting to be released in order to grant wishes. It is more than likely many of these objects have little or no value. Some jinn rituals that have made their way to the West come from the Sufi tradition. The jinn can be conjured in various ways, through child mediumship, through mental clairvoyance and dreams and through manifestation in mirrors, water and other objects. Gazing into a reflective surface such as a mirror is called scrying in the Western tradition and is a time-honoured method of remote viewing, seeing into the future and getting spirits to manifest. The Book of 1001 Nights also tells how to summon jinn. Like demons, jinn are difficult to summon and control. According to law, their natural form is hideous and few people can tolerate it. So God decreed that when they appear to people, they must morph into a more pleasing human or animal form. We have noted that two of the favoured animal forms of the jinn are a black dog and a snake. 
Once summoned, the jinn must be bound to the practitioner, which may be accomplished through binding into an object such as a bottle. For example, the Book of 1001 Nights tells of inscribing the name of God in Hebrew on a knife and drawing magical symbols with incantations written around them. Similarly, a tradition exists in Western magic of capturing small demons called imps into rings, vessels and other objects. The imps are summoned out to do the bidding of the practitioner, a magician or a witch. A little note here. Children up to the ages of 12 to 14 are considered immune to the influences and dangers of jinn. Good. Justification for summoning the jinn. Islam considers it acceptable to call up the jinn in order to educate them on Islam and convince them to convert and worship Allah. Asking the jinn to attack others or aid humans in committing sins and disobedience, however, is forbidden. For the most part, it is believed that consorting with jinn leads to trouble and should not be undertaken. The medieval Islamic scholar Ibn Telmayi probably said that wrong. Ibn Taymiyyah, 1263-1328, regarded the jinn as ignorant, untruthful, oppressive and treacherous. <clears throat> jinn, he said, will lie to their summoners and will not necessarily do as commanded. If they are ordered to harm a person or a jinni whom they hold in high regard, they will ignore the command. Neither the one chanting incantations nor his incantations have any power to force the devils to help them. Furthermore, jinn are fond of creating illusions, appearing in visions and speaking in voices that conform to a conjurer's expectations. They are the ultimate deceivers, masquerading as other spirits such as angels and even religious figures. From that perspective, Christian visions of saints and the Virgin Mary could be jinn illusions. A view the Christian faithful would vehemently reject. Sheikhs, religious authorities, have the knowledge and skills for summoning and controlling jinn. But any one sheikh may not be able to control all jinn. Some learn their skills in a shamanic fashion through healing themselves in an initiatory illness in which they identify the jinni responsible and expel it from their bodies. Islamic sorcerers, male and female, are said to traffic with evil jinn, the children of Iblis. They use red magic to summon them for such tasks as fortune telling and procuring love and money and they use black manage to summon them for evil purposes such as harming people through the evil eye illness, mixed fortune and even murder. Witches use jinn to tie spells and also consult jinn for untying spells cast by other witches. Some of the rituals for conjuring jinn are simple and some like western magical rituals are quite complex involving fasting, meditation, supplications and incantations over long periods of time such as 40 days. Any break in the ritual dooms it to failure. One method of jinn summoning involves a combination of the Quran and a magical text. The text has incantations for summoning jinni in a progressive manner, from weakest to most powerful. The Quran is read in conjunction with the summoning. The practitioner begins with the weakest jinni. If that jinni can be subdued and bound, the practitioner moves on to the next higher jinni. He keeps going until he reaches a jinni too powerful for him to bind and then he moves back to the previous and last jinn he was able to bind. This is the one he will work with. A dangerous game. The risks, the risks of jinn conjuring are substantial, even if the practitioner intends to only work with a good jinni for a purpose such as healing. The same risks apply to any magical practice involving any type of pantheon of entities. A spirit invited to enter the energy space of a human being has the potential for takeover a prospect that includes insanity and possession. Inexperienced practitioners can quickly find themselves in deep trouble and may have difficulty finding someone with skills powerful enough to banish a jinni who has attracted, who has attached to a person. Right, there's a little note here. The authors know a case involving a youth who attempted this method and was mentally destabilised by the jinni. 
Details cannot be divulged to protect privacy, but the youth was institutionalised and a great deal of money was spent to hire an adept in another country who could command a powerful enough ginny to cast out the one afflicting the youth. Dealing with and conjuring one's Karin, that's Q-A-R-I-N, the ginny companion assigned at birth, is dangerous and risky, as it is with most other gin. Trying to command or enslave the Karin can jeopardise one's health or even one's life according to law. If the Karin becomes problematic by exerting too much negative influence over a person, relief may be sought from a professional to perform a banishing ritual. But this too is considered a risky undertaking. If the ritual is not successful, the Karin may become vindictive and cause more problems. It is possible to summon gin with little effort, which can land a person in trouble. Even talking about gin can summon them. Oh, now they tell me. Page 211. And so one must speak of them in whispers or refer to them with euphemisms such as them and those other people. Oh, fantastic. According to Turkish beliefs, green gin are easy to summon because they are very curious about us and will take any opportunities to get closer. The different forms of green gin can take a green gin can take will depend on its age and experience. If their motive is harmless, con contact or curiosity, they may take on a number of forms pleasing to the human eye and to hide their true nature. However, if a ginny is angry or annoyed at a person, it may take on a very hideous appearance that would terrify even the bravest. If open to communication, a green ginny may take on the form of a friendly dog, elf, fairy or even a beautiful, glowing, angelic being. On the other hand, if you summon a ginny who does not want to be bothered, you might be in for a great deal of trouble. Can gin ever be conjured for beneficial purposes? The Quran states that God gave humans authority over all things in creation, which implies inclusion of the jinn. Do you not see that God has subjected to your use all things in the heaven and on the earth? and hast made his bounties flow to you in exceeding measure, both seen and unseen. Sheikhs are able to conjure jinn for mediumship and to learn about a person's illness. For example, a sheikh will ask his personal jinni to talk to the jinni of a sick person in order to find out valuable information about the affliction. It has been suggested that the jinni's ability, abilities of invisibility... The abilities of invisibility... Rapid movement, flying and penetration of the human body and material objects could be harnessed for surveillance, intelligence gathering, crime investigation, weather reporting, transport of objects and medical diagnosis and treatment. Given the inclinations and temperament of the jinn, however, the feasibility and even desirability of a cooperative relationship is questionable. Jinn sorcery. According to Islamic views, Jinn attach themselves to disbelievers and enable them to perform miraculous feats that amaze others, such as predicting the future. This is considered sorcery, and the lies of the jinn influence the disbelievers themselves to lie to others. The Quran states that the lies are based on the information the jinn gleaned from eavesdropping on angels. Should I tell you upon whom the shaitan descend? They descend upon every forging sinner. They cast to them the hearing which they snatch from the heavenly assembly, and most of them are liars. Disbelievers, beguiled by such glamour, become themselves the servants and allies of Iblis. We cannot leave the subject of conjuring the jinn without giving more consideration to their possible influence on Western culture. As we have noted, the distinctions between jinn and other entities are often blurry. Western magic is synthetic, that is, it blends diverse sources, among them Egyptian, Greek, Roman, Judeo-Christian and pre-Islamic Middle Eastern influences absorbed into the culture of the early Hebrews. So we must consider the hidden role of the hidden ones, who are part of that mix. Perhaps the entities who answer the call of magic and who arise in the imaginations of artists and writers are really jinn. We do not have space to examine all of the influences in detail here but the following examples show the complex picture that emerges when one starts tracking down all of the interwoven connections that trace back to the hidden jinn. Did H.P. Lovecraft know the jinn? Strange, unnamed entities who may be jinn populate the fictional works of the famous American horror writer H.P. Lovecraft, 1890-1937. 
an atheist rationalist and scientific materialist, Lovecraft, Lovecraft disavowed, disavowed any personal belief in the supernatural. However, he was steeped in fascination with the supernatural and created his own original mythos. Cthulhu, based on his knowledge of Egyptian and Arabian mythologies and occulted them. His extensive knowledge of Arabian lore brought him into contact with the jinn. Did he weave the jinn into his horror stories? He certainly excelled at evoking a sense of dread of unknown and unnamed horrors dredged up from the dark depths, evocative of the jinn. Of particular note is Lovecraft's Necronomicon, a fictional grimoire of the powerful magical rituals. The Necronomicon was born in his 1936 essay, A History of the Necronomicon. Lovecraft said that the grimoire was originally titled Al-Azif and was written by the mad Arab Abdul Al-Hazared, a fictitious name he derived from the Book of 1001 Nights and an epithet he used to call himself. According to Lovecraft, the mad Arab was a poet who lived in Yemen and wrote the ritual book in 950 CE. Lovecraft said a copy of the book existed in his fictitious city of Arkham. He referred to it in some of his other stories, but never produced an actual book. As interest in his works grew, cult status around the mysterious Necronomicon arose as well. Whether or not such a manuscript ever did exist, versions of it have been found and published. Some Lovecraft enthusiasts believe he knew genuine secret rituals for conjuring the dreaded entities he called the Old Ones or the Great Old Ones, an ancient race older than human beings, huge in size and of immense power. The Old Ones have a physical form composed of a different kind of matter that exists in the human universe. They are imprisoned beneath the sea, inside the earth and on far-flung planets. They either removed themselves or they were banished by the gods for using black magic. They are waiting for the opportunity to rise again and rule the world. The old ones have been compared to extraterrestrials, demons, archetypes, Aristolian elementals and spectres of a future mentality. But they could very well be based on jinn. Banished for their transgressions and residing in remote and far-flung places in this and other dimensions until they can return and reclaim the earth. One of the central old ones in Thehulu, whom Lovecraft introduced in 1926 in The Call of Cthulhu, describes it as a monster of vaguely anthrop anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on its hind and forefeet and long, narrow wings behind. Cthulhu lived in Rylea, an ancient city that had sank beneath the sea. This is an interesting cross-correlation to Jim, for according to Muhammad, the throne of Iblis lies beneath the sea, surrounded by sea serpents. Jabir reported, I heard Allah's messenger, may peace be upon him, as saying, the throne of Iblis is upon the ocean, and he sends detachments to different parts in order to put people to trial, and the most important figure in his eyes is one who is most notorious in sowing the seed of dissension. As noted earlier, some of the jinn conjured by King Solomon came up from the sea, specifically Abazetho, A B E Z I T H O U, a one winged jinni who lives in the Red Sea. Cthulhu's unsettling octopus like form is not out of the question for Jinn, who can shapeshift into any form, especially a disturbing one. According to Lovecraft, the Old Ones are worshipped by a deprived cult, with origins dating back to the first human beings. The cult, wrote Lovecraft in his story, had always existed and always would exist, hidden in distant wastes and dark places all over the world until the time when the great priest Cthulhu, from his dark house in the mighty city of Olay, under the waters, should rise and bring the earth again beneath his sway. Some day he would call when the stars were ready and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. Similarly, the jinn reside in wasteland type places and desolate areas, binding, biding their time. 
The theme of liberating the old ones to let them back into the world appears again in the story The Dunwich Horror, 1929, or Dunwich. The protagonist, Wilbur Watley, the son of a deformed albino woman and Yog Sohoth, a type of god, searches for a Latin edition of the Necronomicon so he may open the gates for the return of the old ones. Watley, or Waitley, is unfortunately killed trying to steal the book, and his twin brother, brother terrorises the town of Dunwich as an invisible monster. The Necronomicon appears elsewhere in Lovecraft's works, the book, 1934. Does not mention it by name, but revolves around a worm-riddled book of rituals obtained by the narrator who uses it to access what appears to be a parallel dimension. After chanting a monstrous litany from within five con concentric, concentric circles, he acquires a permanent shadow entity and is swept away by a black wind into an unknown abyss. When he manages to return, his perception of the world is permanently changed and the shadow is permanently attached to him. The shadow is interesting. Could it be similar to the shadow people shadow people phenomenon described earlier. Did Lovecraft possess secret occult knowledge of the jinn or did his fertile imagination access their realm without his realising it? Many science fiction, fantasy and horror authors are visionaries of genuine realities and they bring awareness of those realities into our dimension via their work. Perhaps Lovecraft had experiences he never acknowledged that seeded his inspiration. Carl L. Johnson, Lovecraft scholar and founder of the H.P. Lovecraft Commemorative Activities Committee notes, One may further postulate that he was capable of receiving such knowledge from the ethereal repository outside himself, in his words, the mind which is held by no head. Time may reveal if Lovecraft was merely a weaver of convincing tales or something of a prophet in his own right. Cultists still do devise and perform rituals intended to open chasms to the dread dimension and unleash Denzians of the netherworlds with rites based largely on the fantasy of Lovecraft. Anton LaVey, 1930-1997, who founded the Church of Satan in 1966, was inspired by Lovecraft in creating rituals for his church. LaVey, whose real name was Howard Stanton LaVey, believed Lovecraft was influenced by real occult sources, wrote LeVay. Whether his sources of inspiration were consciously recognised and admitted or a remarkable psychic absorption, one can only speculate. There is no doubt that Lovecraft was aware of rites not quite nameless, as the allusions in his stories are often identical to actual ceremonial procedures and nomenclature. Oh dear especially to those practised and advanced around the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries. Gin and the Golden Dawn LeVay's comments move us into the hermetic order of the Golden Dawn, the greatest Western esoteric order founded in England in 1888 by individuals steeped in occultism, including the Kabbalah, Freemasonry, Theosophy, Rosicrucianism and Western esoteric and magical law. The Golden Dawn began as an esoteric order and evolved along magical lines using as primary sources the Key of Solomon, the Book of Sacred Magic of Abra Melin, the, Ma the Marge, and Enochian Magic, all of which have jinn roots. I probably said all that wrong. The Book of Sacred Magic of Abra Melin, the Marge, M-H-E-E, is heavily derivative of the Key. It is attributed to Abramelin, also spelled Abramelin. <laughs> one of them's got a hyphen, the other one hasn't. A Jewish Kabbalistic... Mark, how do I say M-A-G-E? Mage. Mage. Alright. A Jewish Kabbalistic mage of Würzburg, Germany, who supposedly wrote the Grimoire for his son in 1458. Though the manuscript claims to be a translation of Abramelin's original Hebrew manuscript, it was written in French in the 18th century, probably by an anonymous source. According to the story presented in the manuscript, Abramelin learned his Kabbalah-based magical knowledge from angels, who told him how to conjure demons 
and tamed them into personal servants and workers, similar to King Solomon, and how to raise storms. He said that all things in the world are created by demons who work under the direction of angels. Each person has an angel and a demon as familiar spirits, similar to the daemons and the Karim. Abramelin magic is based on sacred names and on magical squares of numbers for purposes such as conjuring spirits, invisibility, levitation and flight, commanding spirits, necromancy, shape-shifting and other feats, all within the abilities and powers of the jinn. Enochian magic evolved from the 16th century occult work done by John Dee, the royal astronomer to Queen Elizabeth I, and his assistant, Edward Kelly, who claimed to have psychic ability. Dee and Kelly used scrying and Kelly's mediumship to communicate with beings they identified as angels. Dee and Kelly developed an alphabet and genuine language, Enochian, for constructing calls, for contacting angels and spirits, and for projecting consciousness into levels of awareness called Aethers, or Aethers, A-E-T-H-Y-R-S. Enochian has a melodic sound to Sanskrit, similar to Sanskrit, Greek or Arabic. Kelly, who had a reputation for fraud, may have invented the language himself, telling Dee that it was spoken angels in the Garden of Eden. Dee and Kelly developed 19 calls of ascending magnitude. The 19th call included 30 Aethers, or Aethers, that were never precisely defined, but which the Golden Dawn believed represented new levels of consciousness. The only member of the Golden Dawn during its short original life ever known to work actively with the Aethers was Alistair Crowley. Ba, ba, ba. Alistair Crowley, the Beast of the Apocalypse. Alistair Crowley, 1875-1947, to was arguably the most colourful figure to ever emerge in Western magical history. Precocious and dark in temperament from an early age, he seemed to possess an innate rapport with the spirit world, as well as a natural ability to tap into its power. Though his mother referred to him as the Beast, and he later called himself the Beast of the Apocalypse, he was not a Satanist. He envisioned ushering in a new religion and spiritual age, the Aeon of Horus, based on the system of Thelemic magic, inspired by his experience with entities. In 1898, he joined the Golden Dawn, but clashed violently in personality and power issues with Samuel Liddell McGregor Mathers, one of the original founders. Within a couple of years, Crowley was kicked out and went off on his way. Crowley had numerous entity contacts and was adept at conjuring or evoking them in magical rituals. In addition to his own inspirations, he used Abramelin and Enochian magic. Three entities are of interest to us for their possible gin connections. In 1903, Crowley married Rose Kelly, the first of two wives who had mediumship ability. They spent their honeymoon, honeymoon in Cairo in 1904 where Rose spontaneously made contact with an entity called Awis, originally spelled A-I-W-A-Z. Awis, we're spelling here A-I-W-A-S-S, -S, said he was a messenger from the Egyptian trinity of deities Isis, Hor Isis, Osiris and Horus. Crowley had a vision of seeing him, seeing Awis as a man dressed in old Assyrian or Persian clothing and having what he described as a body of fine matter, or astral matter, transparent as a veil of gauze or a cloud of incense smoke. He seemed to be a tall, dark man in his twenties, well-knit, active and strong, with the face of a savage king and the eyes veiled lest their gaze should be destroy what they saw. Awas ordered Crowley to take dictation. For three hours between April the 8th and 10th, 1904, the entity spoke in a voice that emanated directly out of the air, while Crowley wrote in longhand. The result was the Book of the Law, the seminal work of the Thelemic Magic, which contains the axiom, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, do what you must to surrender to total alignment with cosmic law. For years, Crowley remained in awe of Iwis and admitted he never fully understood exactly who or what the entity was. He alternatively, alternately described him as good, demon, evil, Preta-human intelligence, minister or messenger of other gods, and his own guardian angel. For a time, he considered Iris part of his own subconscious, but then rejected the idea, 
favouring at last the explanation that the entity was his holy guardian angel or an aspect of his higher self. Crowley also said he was occasionally allowed to see Iris in a physical appearance, inhabiting, inhabiting a human body like a normal human being. Over the years, opinions on Iris have run the gamut from benign to evil. It cannot be determined whether or not Iris was a ginny, of course, but his smoke-like dark appearance, Middle Eastern garb and ability to take on a human form evoke gin associations. Was Crowley in contact with a gin representative who wished to channel certain ideas into the mortal world? In 1909, Crowley made contact with Coronzon, an entity known by D, who spelled the name C-O-R-O-N-Z-O-M and referred to it as 333. D never considered Coronzon a demon, but Crowley called it the demon of dispersion and the demon of the abyss. He also said Coronzon was the first and deadliest of all the powers of evil and a being comprised of complete negation. Could Coronzon be Iblis or one of his high-ranking jinn? In December of 1909, Crowley and his assistant, Victor Newberg, Newberg went into the desert outside Algiers to conduct rituals for the purpose of accessing the high-level ethers in the 19th call of Enochian magic. Crowley had a number of breakthroughs in consciousness as a result, including the instruction that he would have to confront Coronzon and cross the abyss. In an evocation, a magician stays within the protection of a magical circle and evokes an entity into a separate magical triangle. Crowley intended to break that rule and sit within the triangle, go into trance and offer his own body for possession, a dangerous magical act. According to Crowley's account, Newberg, standing within the protected magical circle, got the brunt of the entity's for force. First, Caronzo manifested in the form of a seductive female prostitute and then turned into an old man and then into a snake. Caronzon told Newberg he spat upon the name of the Most High he was master of the triangle who had no fear of the pentagram. He said he would give Newberg words that seemed like great secrets of magic but would be worthless as a joke. Coronzon breached the protection of the magical circle around Newberg and the two wrestled physically, although some observers have put of a pine that Newberg wrestled with a demon in Trance Crowley. Newberg insisted he fought the entity itself. It had froth-covered froth fangs and attempted to tear out his throat. After a considerable struggle, Newberg forced Coronzon back into the triangle and repaired his magical circle. The two hurled insults and threats at each other, and Coronzon vanished. Crowley and Newberg felt they had bested the demon, and Crowley considered himself to have achieved a great magical state great magical status as a result. Some critics of Crowley's work believe that Coronzon left a permanent mental and psychic scar upon him. We cannot prove Caronzon's true identity, but like Alwis, jinn presence is strongly suggested. The snake is a favoured form of jinn, and the trickster-like taunting is telling as well. A hostile jinny summoned from the depth of its realm in another dimension might easily attack in such an aggressive manner, boasting that the magical rules of mortals have no effect upon them. In 1918, Crowley made contact with a powerful entity named Lamb who was to help him fulfil the work Awas had began. The contact was made through a sex, sex magic ritual in which he opened a portal in the spaces between stars, a parallel dimension, enabling Lamb to enter the physical universe. Crowley believed Lamb to be the soul of a dead Tibetan Lama from Leng, between China and Tibet. Lamb is Tibetan for way or path, which Crowley said had the numerical value of 71, or no thing a gateway to the void and a link between the star systems of Sirius and Andromeda. Since that time, some followers of Crowley's work have come to believe that the portal he opened continues to widen, enabling other entities to enter our world that are behind our experiences with UFOs and extraterrestrials. As we have noted, we found a significant connection between Jinn and UFOs ETs. Crowley drew an image of Lamb and it is believed by some that meditating on or contemplating this image enables contact with Lamb and access to the portal. 
the entity of entities sorry the entry of entities through a portal to a parallel realm is yet another interesting correlation with the history and activities of jim the idea that the jinn may be behind major forces of western occult thought will undoubtedly be controversial to some and be outright rejected by others we believe the evidence is there and has been hiding in plain sight for centuries just like the jinn themselves if factions of the jinn are intent on regaining their hold on the physical world they would infiltrate as many streams of human thought and action as possible certainly we should expand our perspective beyond the entities familiar to us in the west an act that could help us gain valuable insight into the nature of all our extraordinary experiences real-time evp or gin there is yet another way we might be in contact with the gin one that is quite popular with modern paranormal researchers and investigators electronic voice phenomena or evp Ever since the development of the telegraph, tape recording, the telephone, the radio and high-tech communications, people have been hearing and recording mysterious voices of unknown origin. In the 1970s, these voices came to be called electronic voice phenomena. Most of the voices are thought to be of the dead and some from extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial realms. In traditional EVP, developed since the early, early 20th century, a recorder is turned on, questions are asked, time is allowed to elapse for an answer, and the recording is played back. Answers to the questions, EVP, may appear in the gaps. Newer techniques involve real-time answers, that is, hearing the voices live rather than passively after they are recorded. Real-time EVP is one of the cutting-edge technologies of paranormal research. We have been experimenting with a range of ex- of equipment for real-time EVP, taking it to different paranormal hotspots to see if we can contact the dead or beings in other dimensions. The devices used for this employ radio sweep. They are, pro- they are popularly known as ghost boxes and Frank's boxes, the latter name referring to one of the developers in the field, Frank Assumption. The boxes rapidly scan the AM radio, AM band of radio. Some also scan FM to create a jumbled noise matrix composed of broadcast fragments. This matrix of of sounds seems to facilitate the manifestation of mystery voices. Their answers do not come from the fragments of radio broadcast, but are superimposed on top of the jumbled sound. We acknowledge that the use of real-time EVP boxes is controversial and unpredictable. You never know what you're going to get, and it is often impossible to validate the identities of communicators, because the communications are brief, like passive EVP. Answers to questions usually are just one or two words. Getting a communicator to stay on the line, so to speak, is difficult, probably because of our limited technology. How real-time radio sweep EVP works. Because of his scientific background, Phil has been trained to question extraordinary claims. He was very sceptical when he first heard about the ghost box. However, after working with it a number of times with Rosemary, he became convinced that it was picking up voices that were beyond this realm of reality. Phil felt there was no other explanation. According to our current understanding of modern physics, the voices should not be there. What is most remarkable about the ghost box is that who or whatever is on the other end responds to questions the operators ask. The ghost box operates by scanning through an entire band with the EVP being received over a number of adjacent frequencies in the AM, FM and upper and lower sidebands. This means the EVP is not on any particular channel, but is a signal with a very wide bandwidth that our research shows is spread over 100 kilohertz or greater. In our opinion, this is what makes it so unusual. In order for the device to work and pick up a spirit voice, you must have a strong standard signal. So the more crowded the band with radio stations, the better your chance of getting EVP. It seems the EVP part of the signal is so weak that it needs to be stronger standard AM signal on which to piggyback in order to be heard. The piggyback effect is simple to understand. One weaker radio signal on the same frequency rides on another stronger one to reach the receiver. 
This is what seems to be happening with the mystery voices on the ghost box. They are riding or piggybacking on standard AM radio station transmissions to the receiver. Due to the sweeping effect, the commercial AM transmission is garbled, but the EVP comes through clearly with a different sound and with fully formed words. Light and radio signals follow the curvature of space, so theoretically these messages should not be able to reach our reality from another dimension unless tiny holes, perhaps the size of atoms, are somehow created in a space-time continuum. Such holes could create a bridge or tunnel to connect our world with the dimension of the djinn. What makes matters so puzzling is that the operator uses no transmitting equipment at all. It seems that the voice of the operator and the questions asked are heard by the entity directly on the other side. Or it may be possible that the voice of the operator is being transmitted through the circuits in the radio. It is interesting to note that sometimes, despite optimal, optimal conditions, the ghost box does not work at all. The person operating the device seems to play an important part in its success. Some people never get results, while others frequently do. We believe that the psychic makeup and attitude of the individual operating the ghost box is an important component in its success, though we also must consider that the intelligence on the other side may want to communicate only with certain people. There is a considerable amount of research and analysis to be done in this area, but the one conclusion we have reached is that the ghost box, although limited in its performance, does work. Gin communication using the mini box. One of our favourite real-time EVP devices is the mini box, developed by Ron Ricketts of Carrollton, Texas. The mini box features multiple scan methods, programmable memory, printed circuit boards, a long-lasting rechargeable gel battery and a controllable rate of scan. We have taken the mini box to some of the stone chambers in upstate New York that Phil researched in connection with his UFO investigations. The chambers have been associated with apparitions, poltergeist activity, mysterious lights, visions, appearances of shadow people and hooded beings and other phenomena. We believe the chambers sit on energised sites that serve as interdimensional portals. At one, we got quite a surprise when the communicators identified themselves as Jin. On a hot summer day in 2009, we took the mini box to one of the most famous stone chambers. We prefer not to disclose the exact location in order to protect the site's integrity and set it up at the entrance. In a typical session, it takes five to ten minutes to synchronise with whoever is communicating. There is an initial warm-up period, after which intense communication usually begins. After about 30 to 40 minutes of peak intensity, the links start breaking up and communication declines. We can only speculate that the energy can hold for just a certain amount of time. During the peak, various communicators come and go. We believe it is possible to get only a fraction of what is being issued from their side, and perhaps they only hear a fraction of what we say in return. The session at this particular chamber was exceptionally long, about 70 minutes. The communicators accurately told us our first names as recognition. We asked who built this chamber and heard back God did, weapon, Satan. Was the chamber a portal or tool of some sort in the perpetual struggle between good and evil, we wondered. It was not the answer we expected. Who are you, we asked the unseen speakers. Jin was the immediate answer. They also told us they liked our box device for communication and that the chamber was a portal. Do you come through the chamber, we asked. Through, they said. Where are you, we asked. In the park and in the chamber, they said. The chamber is located in a state park deep in the woods. It seemed as though the communicators had come through an interdimensional portal and manifested in the space around us. We usually repeat questions to see if we get consistent responses. Are you human? We asked. Negative. Demon. Are you gin? Uh, ha. Huh. Surprises. Who is here beside demons? Satan. Demons. Monster. After this reply, we heard strange sound and laughter. Tell us who you are, we repeated. Gin. Is anyone here besides gin? No. Give us more information. No. This was followed by more weird laughter. We could not get past this trickster-like exchange for the remainder of the session. 
During the peak intensity, we both felt enveloped by a strange energy or atmosphere, as though the air around us was being electromagnetically charged. Neither of us had expected Jin to show up and identify themselves. In fact, in all the years that both of us have been experimenting with EVP of varying types, neither of us had ever heard directly from Jin in a manner such as this. We have heard communicators identify themselves as the dead entities in other realms and as extraterrestrials. Perhaps the Jin decided to reveal themselves because they knew about the research we were conducting for this book. Our results made us wonder just how many other EVP communications are a summoning of Jin who masquerade as the dead, aliens, angels and other entities. Given the present limits of technology, we have little way of knowing for certain who is at the other end of the connection. At the very best, we might be the victims of tricksters. At worst, we could be already led astray in accordance with the Jin agenda. Future EVP Experimentation The success of picking up complex EVP on the standard AM band has produced limited success, but it has proved to us that communication can be established with another reality using standard electromagnetic radiation. One of the problems with the commercial AM band is that it is simply too noisy. If the djinn exists in another nearby dimension, it seems the only way for them to get clear reception of possible EVP signals is to punch holes in the Earth's magnetosphere and dimensional rift. As stated earlier, occurrence of these holes may be natural and dependent on the amount of solar radiation reaching Earth. Theoretically, one might have more success in obtaining clear EVP by eavesdropping on a frequency that is able to pick up signals from beyond the ionosphere, a portion of Earth's upper atmosphere. The section of the radio band best suited for this is the very low frequency area of the electromagnetic spectrum. VLF receivers are simple but relatively uncommon, consisting only of an antenna and an audio amplifier. They are sensitive to radio waves with frequencies between a few hundred hertz and several hundred kilohertz. For, for comparison, AM broadcast band radios, like the ones in the ghost boxes and most automobiles, span the much higher frequency range, 540 kilohertz to 1.6 megahertz. A signal on this frequency possesses a very long wavelength and would be able to reach us from the magnetic field that encompasses our planet. This band is very quiet with few man-made transmissions. For many years, scientists, researchers and radio enthusiasts have picked up strange signals from this region that have not been fully understood. If the human body had radio antennas instead of ears, people would hear a remarkable symphony of strange noises coming from the space that surrounds our planet. Scientists call them tweaks, whistlers and snap, crackle and pop. At times, these sounds picked up in the VLF band are so strange they seem suited for the background noise of a science fiction film. These remarkable radio emissions are real, are real and although scientists don't fully understand how they are produced, they are around us all the time. The source of most VLF emissions on Earth is lightning. Lightning bolts emit a broadband pulse of radio waves, just as they unleash a visible flash of light. VLF signals from nearby lightning heard through the loudspeaker of a radio sound like bacon frying in a pan or the crackling and popping of a campfire. Even if there is no lightning in your area, depending on the size and efficiency of your antenna and the sensitivity of the receiver, you can still hear VLF lightning crackles from storms thousands of kilometres away. Sometimes the, ionos the ionosphere leaks lightning pulses into space. These pulses exit the atmosphere entirely and follow Earth's magnetic field lines that guide them more than 13,000 kilometres above the surface and back into our planet's magnetosphere. It is this phenomenon that scientists think are responsible for the whistlers because they sound like slowly descending tones. Whistlers are dispersed because they travel great distances through magnetic plasmas which coincidentally enough are strongly dispersive media for VLF signals. It is theorised by scientists at the NASA Marshall Space Centre that
that some of these returning flashes of lightning produce plasma that could create holes in the magnetic field of our planet. This theory intrigued us since this is what might be needed to connect the world of the gym with our own. In 2009, Rosemary was able to purchase a Panasonic RF4900 radio receiver, a model the company no longer manufactures. This receiver was one of the great radios from an earlier period before the days of satellite transmissions. It is amazing that she was able to find one, as the few that are left are owned by die-hard old ham radio operators and short-wave listeners who see them as collector's items. Although the receiver has the potential to become a super EVP box, it lacks one feature. It does not receive in the VLF area. Rosemary was able to find a converter and with Phil's know-how, being an old ham radio operator himself, we were able to connect the receiver and get the converter working properly. However, at that low frequency, the wavelength is very long and one needs an antenna several hundred feet long to even hope of picking up signals from the upper atmosphere and beyond. As a temporary fix, we hooked up 20 feet of 20 gauge insulated copper wire to act as an antenna. On our first attempt at a frequency of 100 kilohertz, we picked up a strange series of faint tones that sounded like navigation signals. The sounds lasted for about five minutes then grew fainter and eventually vanished. The tone sounded artificial in nature and definitely should not have been there. It seemed odd to us that we turned on the receiver at the exact time and frequency to pick up this transient signal. Perhaps some other other intelligence was involved and wanted us to hear something on our first attempt. Was the signal coming from another dimension or a parallel reality? We might never know for sure, but two things are certain. The signals should not have been there and we never picked them up again. Over the next several weeks of listening in the wee hours of the morning, Phil was able to pick up sounds that sounded like popping and crackling, which he was able to identify as electrical bursts in the upper atmosphere. However, on more than one occasion, he picked up unusual sounds that were almost musical in nature. After considerable research, we found out that NASA, in addition to a number of independent researchers around the globe, had also been receiving the sounds for years. No one can fully explain them. The sounds have been attributed to natural discharges of plasma energy in the magnetosphere. Again, the word plasma caught our attention as it relates to gin physiology. It is possible they might discharge energy in the same way as other celestial bodies, resulting in some of the spreading across the VLF spectrum. Of course, this is pure speculation, but speculation often leads to discovery. A bold experiment. We intend to do more research with both the mini box and the Panasonic and to use the VLF band and fully document these signals. We plan to find a large field where we can set up a series of very long dipole antennas which will greatly expand our capabilities in receiving the mysterious signals on the low frequency radio band. As the EVP is rather weak we are also in the process of designing a low power transmitter that will produce a signal with a dead carrier, which will allow the EVP to piggyback on it. Besides the many technical difficulties that await us, the biggest problem still lies ahead. Communication is a two way street. And if the other side is not interested in conversation, there will not be any results. Perhaps a gin like using the crowded radio signal bands communicate with us since most of the messages are partial and almost cryptic in nature perhaps the communication is a game that green gin play with humans we cannot tell you what the chances of success are but one thing is for sure if we do not try our results definitely will be zero in the months that follow the publication of this book we will publish any successful results our readers are invited to get in touch with us at the emails and website listed in the about the author section cool that was a long one the next one i think it's the last one the next one is the last one and after that it's appendix appendix right so the last one is called dealing with the gin so that talks about exercising them blah 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 blah. 
Okay. Right. Bye.